problem is, is that a lot of people get exposed and they're not even aware. Lyme disease usually doesn't act alone. There's oftentimes other root causes that jump on board. It affects almost every system of the body and it's different for every person. What advice would you give to someone who suspects they might have Lyme disease or they've been struggling with persistent symptoms? Dr. Warren, why do up to 25% of Lyme disease patients develop long-term symptoms after being treated with antibiotics? Well, it's a good question. So um, there's a lot of factors that go into, first of all, why some people get sick and others don't, and then other factors that go into why some people have successful initial treatment and others don't. Um, a lot of it has to do with the timing of that treatment when there's initial exposure um, to the main bacteria that causes Lyme disease, which is Borrelia burgdorferi, there's a, a window that uh, you have essentially for it to be pretty treatable because it's still in the blood, it's still accessible uh, in the body to broad spectrum antibiotics like, doxycy excuse me, like doxycycline. Um, once it migrates into the central nervous system, uh, which is the brain and the spinal cord, then it's it's much more difficult to treat. So a lot of times you get these cases where patients end up having later stages chronic Lyme because it wasn't caught initially, it wasn't treated quick enough, um, and then it it becomes much more difficult because of where it migrates to in the body. Okay, so if it is caught early enough, then antibiotics will be effective in treating it. In most cases, yes, it, it is, uh, you know, there are certain defense mechanisms that, that bacteria has that make it a bit unique and, and in some cases more difficult to treat, but it is susceptible to tetracyclines, to, to doxycycline specifically, as well as cephalosporins and, and some other antibiotics. So if it's, if you're able to treat it early when it's more accessible in the body, then it is fairly treatable and most people recover from that acute exposure. It's, it's just where it's not treated quick enough and it migrates, that's where it becomes a, a much more difficult problem. How early is early? Um, it's, it's variable, honestly, but the, the time frame that you're typically looking at is usually between about one to three months after initial exposure. Um, that you want to, to to try and get treated. Obviously, the sooner the better, um, because there is a range there, and and sometimes waiting three months is too long. Um, but that's usually about the range that you want to to treat it. The problem is is that a lot of people get exposed, and they're not even aware because the the ticks are so small, they don't realize there's been an exposure, um, and then by the time they realize, uh, it's you know manifest into a much more difficult. Uh, disease to treat. You specialize in advanced natural medicine. So mm -hmm. say someone's listening and they've passed that three month mark, what would be the best approach for them to take? Well, it depends honestly on a couple factors. It depends on their uh, symptoms that they're having and how it's affected them. Um, it's also going to be dependent on the other concomitant root causes, meaning that Lyme disease usually doesn't act alone. There's oftentimes other root causes that jump on board that um, complicate the picture and can make it more difficult to treat. So obviously, if you have 10 problems, it's going to be harder to fix than three problems. So it, it depends on kind of what the root causative factors are. Um, but certainly, testing is, is the most important thing, because I think that's where a lot of Lyme patients run into trouble is they can't get a proper diagnosis. And, and a lot of that has to do with just the, um, the downside of, of the conventional testing, the limitation of the conventional testing, and the chance of high false negatives. So the first thing is to get a proper diagnosis, go to somebody who uh, um, has experience in diagnosing Lyme disease and, and is thorough um, and doesn't just depend on you know, the, the conventional testing, because a lot of times the diagnosis is missed that way. Is it difficult for people to be correctly diagnosed with Lyme? Very, yeah, much more difficult than most infectious diseases for, for a couple of reasons. One, because of what I just mentioned in terms of the testing being pretty poor um, and there being a lack of understanding how to test for it and the nuances of, um, 
you know, making that diagnosis. Um, but then also clinically, it's very hard to identify because unlike most diseases where, especially infectious diseases, where they present pretty similarly in, in everyone, this can present in different ways for every single person. Um, and that's because Lyme disease, unlike other infectious diseases, it affects almost every system of the body and it's different for every person. So you can have one person with neurological symptoms, another person with GI symptoms, another person that's cardiovascular, another person that's musculoskeletal. Um, it's so variable in how it presents that it can be very challenging to identify as a practitioner. I see. In Vita Medical Center, where you practice, mm -hmm. has identified seven overlooked factors in standardized healthcare that contribute to persistent Lyme disease. Could you elaborate on what those factors are? Sure. Yeah. So, um, first and foremost is the testing that I mentioned to you. So, that's, you know, having the right testing, understanding uh, what is necessary to make that diagnosis. Um, antibiotics is the, the main treatment for the majority of the infections that are uh, correlated to Lyme and, and related to Lyme because most of them are bacteria. And so for antibiotic protocols, the biggest concern that you have is um, antibiotic resistance. So having ways to cut down on that antibiotic resistance. Uh, the third way would be to understand where Lyme likes to hide. Um, and that's in the central nervous system. Like I said, it's why you see so many neurological symptoms with Lyme disease and having the right tools to be able to get into the central nervous system because our body is designed to keep things out of there. So um, unless you have specialized ways to get to where the, the bacteria is hiding, that's where you get, um, you know, is the biggest challenge in treating it. So that's a big one. I think, especially on the Lyme side, that the biggest challenge is where it's located so having things to get through that blood-brain barrier. Um, another defense mechanism that Lyme has and other infections have as well is uh, biofilm. So for those who aren't familiar with biofilm, it's essentially a barrier, a shield that the bacteria and other infections create to shield itself and protect itself from things like antibiotics in the immune system. So being able to understand biofilms and getting rid of those in order to successfully treat the infections is, is really, really important. Um, toxins is what is the fifth one. Those are what are produced by infections that cause the symptoms. And so part of getting well is certainly killing the infections, but you have to have ways to eliminate those toxins from the body as well in order to, to heal and to see that symptomatic improvement. So detoxification is a really, really important part of the process and um, what we do a lot of here in addition to the anti-infectious treatments. Six would be um, pain meds, and sometimes pain meds can be important for managing symptoms. It's not a, a, a long-term fix, but it's certainly um, you know, a short-term fix in terms of managing the symptoms while you're treating the root causes, the root underlying factors. And pain meds, while they can be helpful, they have their own challenges. You know, they can be immunosuppressive, um, they can slow down the GI tract, which then makes detoxification harder. Um, so being able to navigate that appropriately can be a challenge. And then lastly would be the immune system. The immune system is our main defense against everything. And so a lot of times the, the biggest reason why it's so hard for Lyme patients to get well is because their immune system isn't working properly. And so being able to get that immune system back online, especially for long-term healing, which of course is what everybody wants, um, that's vital in order to, to see that long-term success, to get that body working the way that it was meant to and be able to fight off these, you know, things that we're exposed to that can be harmful to the body. You mentioned one of the factors was specialized ways to get it out of the centralized nervous system. What would be an example of one of those specialized ways? So um, there's, there's several things you can do to try and essentially open up the blood-brain barrier. Um, but like I said, it's designed to keep things out. So you have to have these, these strategies to, to get in there appropriately. And so uh, we have uh, one of the main tools that we have, uh, we call IRAD, which is essentially a treatment that uh, forces the body to open up the blood-brain barrier so we can get the medicines into that central nervous system. 
effectively. Um, and that's something that we've been doing for, for many, many years um, that is unique to us that I think is a big reason why we get such great success with our Lyme patients, at least one of the big reasons. And then you mentioned eliminating toxins. So mm -hmm. how, how would you recommend someone detoxify the body? So there's four main ways that we get rid of toxins or toxicities from the body. Um, it's through uh, respiration, uh, which is through the lungs um, when we breathe. There's perspiration, which is through the skin when, when we sweat. Those are secondary organs of detoxification. So meaning that they are um, the backup, essentially. The main ways that we uh, get rid of toxins and toxicities is through urine and stool. So defecation and urination. Um, that's through the kidneys and the GI tract. And so um, those main pathways are what you want to stimulate in order to help the body get rid of as much as, as it can. And so you do things to support the liver, the GI tract, the lymphatic system, the kidneys, um, and then secondarily the respiratory system and then and the skin as well. So there's a lot of different things you can do in terms of um, things you can do orally, you know, things you can do at home, um, specialized um, things that we refer out for specific treatments, but um, it's a big part of the healing process, in my opinion. So just for some concrete examples to give the listeners, would that be things like breath work, sauna, maybe dry brushing? Yeah, so dry brushing is great, great for lymphatic. Uh, lymphatic massage is another way to stimulate lymphatic system. Um, Certainly saunas can be helpful, um, far infrared especially, because it helps target the lymphatic system specifically, in addition to the, the perspiration that you get from it being hot. Um, and then, you know, there's other things you can do that, uh, and, and obviously it's dependent, excuse me, it's dependent on the person and whether these things are indicated and safe, of course, but, you know, things like colonics and, um, castor oil packs and that kind of thing. And would you say that diet plays a role? <clears throat> diet definitely plays a role. Yeah. So uh, we have individualized dietary recommendations for our patients based on uh, the, the case. Everything we do is individualized. But um, sometimes, you know, for instance, the example I like to give to my patients is that let's say one of the main players in the case fungal burden. They have a, a really high burden of candida. You can do more of like an anti-candida diet. Or let's say there's a high burden of parasites. You know, it's a, it's a parasitic case than more of an anti-parasitic diet. Um, those are examples of, of more specialized recommendations based on what the data is showing. Uh, but in general, you know, something like a, an anti-inflammatory diet, because obviously these infections and different things that correlate can cause a lot of inflammation is is typically a generalized diet that's helpful. And what would be an example of an anti-inflammatory diet? So it, it would be, you know, eating the right oils um, or using the right oils. It would be... Oh, I'm sorry. What are the right oils? <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, you know, things like olive oil, avocado oil, um, you know, trying to avoid some of the the oils that increase your omega sixes, which are your more in, uh, inflammatory uh, omegas, and so those are going to be like avoiding your canola oil, your your plant based oils, essentially um, rapeseed and and you know those kind of oils. Um, coconut oil is another really great one that is uh, anti inflammatory. So the right oils, it, it's you know. Uh, um, Cutting down on on red meat intake uh, because red meat generally your your beef your uh, pork is going to be more inflammatory meat so focusing more on your white meats like chicken and turkey those kind of things um, of course choosing good sources you know grass fed and organic when available um, it's it's doing your high fatty fish that that are wild caught if if uh, available because um, those are going to be high omega threes those are going to be anti inflammatory as well. So there's, there's different things you can do, but those are some of the, the big ones. You mentioned how you develop personalized treatment plans for your mm -hmm. patients. So what methodologies do you use to ensure their effectiveness? So it's going to be, so everything we do personally is research-based. So we're a very research-driven, data-driven clinic. Um, obviously, we want to make sure that 
the choices that we're making for patients first and foremost are safe, but also that there's good data to support the why of what we're choosing. Um, but a lot of it has to do with, you know, just doing very comprehensive upfront testing, um, especially for the patients that we see, since we see more of the complex cases, we're typically, we're not the first stop, we're typically the last stop. And so patients have been a lot of other places, they've, you know, failed other treatments, um, haven't been able to get answers or help. And so um, we get more complex cases. And so usually there's a lot of root causes at play. And so we're doing pretty comprehensive testing up front to identify all of those problems, those variables. And then we have different tools that we use to address each one. And everything we do is per the patient because everyone is different in terms of what their, the players are essentially, what, what the root causes are. So um, that's why, you know, in, in our experience and, and what we typically recommend, it's pretty vital to do individualized medicine when you're treating this patient population. What are some success stories of patients who have overcome Lyme disease symptoms through your treatments? Oh, great question. There's so many. Um, we have a, a, a testimonial on our website that sometimes I'll just look through to remind myself of all the, the successes and why we do what we do. Um, and those are just you know, the, the, either the patients who want to do a testimonial or have had an exceptional case, you know, it, it doesn't encapsulate all of the successes that we have. So we, we get really good results. So we have quite a few, but there are certain ones, you know, especially as you can imagine, the more sick a person is to start, the greater potential healing response you can see. And so I've certainly had several cases of patients who come in in wheelchairs, they're not able to walk, you know, they're not able to um, complete daily functions that we take for granted, you know, on a daily basis. Um, and they're in the hospital, every, you know, multiple times a week, they're having seizures. Um, and I've seen many, many cases of people who wear the seizures, they go away. Um, they're able to walk out of the clinic. Um, sometimes, you know, they're not able to, to talk um, appropriately. Their memory is so compromised that, you know, it's, essentially a shell of a person who you're having a conversation with. You can just see them blossom and, and become the person they were meant to be. And it's pretty special. So I know that wasn't extremely specific, but there's been so many cases of, that I've seen of just people changing before your eyes. It, it's pretty special. You also have seven goals for healing Lyme disease. Could you explain what those are? Yeah. Um, so in terms of um, you know, the, the kind of goes back somewhat to the challenges that I talked about. First and foremost is getting the proper diagnosis. Um, so that correlates there. And then, um, and then the rest of the goals kind of speak towards um, first identifying all the root causes, then being able to come up with a, a plan to treat those root causative factors appropriately. Um, then it's, you know, stabilizing the disease process. Um, it's working on the removal of those offending agents, so killing those infections, getting those toxicities um, out of their hiding place, essentially. Then it's detoxification, which is essentially the, the removal of all of those things from the body. Um, and then usually the final piece of that is, um, you know, giving the body time to heal and seeing those processes that have not been functioning for, for such a long time in most cases, um, you know, seeing those improve over time and allowing the body to start functioning again. So it is a multi-step process, but um, one that is achievable. Now, are all these steps implemented kind of together at the same time, or is there a strategic order to which you, you implement them in order to get the best results? Like, could somebody start different, limiting their toxins in different ways while they change their diet and do the other um, protocols that you give them at the same time? Yeah, most of the time, and, and this is a bit of a unique strategy for us, um, just because this is what we've seen to be successful. And because we see a lot of patients who are coming from different states, they're coming from different countries sometimes. Most, the majority of our patients are out of state or out of country. 
um, we have limited windows in terms of what we're trying to do. So our strategy is to identify all of the problems and then fix them all simultaneously. What, you know, sometimes you go to clinics and they'll try and do one thing at a time. And, and the challenge there, especially when it's really complex disease, is that you end up kind of playing this whack-a-mole game where you take care of one problem and then another one pops up and you take care of another problem and another one pops up. So um, especially since, you know, we're trying to do a lot, we're trying to reverse a lot of dysfunction in a relatively short period of time. You know, a lot of times we have patients who they've been sick for decades in some cases, and we're trying to reverse most of that in a matter of a couple months. Um, so it, it is, you know, intensive protocols, but we're doing everything simultaneously just to allow um, you know, allow us to, to take care of all those problems at once so we don't end up playing that whack-a-mole game. Mm. Cover all the bases? Yeah, exactly. My final question before my final question. Okay. What advice would you give to someone who suspects they might have Lyme disease or they've been struggling with persistent symptoms? Yeah, so great question. Um, the first thing to do is to, you know, go to a clinic or go to a, a doc who has experience in doing proper testing. Um, you know, like I said, just doing kind of the conventional testing can get you into trouble because it has such a high chance of false negatives. A lot of times you can miss the diagnosis. So um, I guess even before I say that, the first thing to do is to act quickly. Um, is not to delay because, like I said, there is a, a, a kind of a, a time frame that you need to work within in order to have the best chance of treating this in the early stages. Secondarily, would be to find a practitioner who who knows the testing, who is able to think outside the box and do the the, the right investigation to get that diagnosis. Um, and then to to kind of build on top of that is you know, to have the right treatment strategies depending on what they find. So, um, you know, that's something that is important to us. And what we do for patients is to, you know, get patients in as quickly as possible, test as quickly as possible, and then, you know, have the right treatments depending on what we find. Before I ask the final question, where would you like to send people? Um, so if you're interested in learning more about Invita, um, you can go on our website. It's www.invita.com. So it's E-N-V-I-T-A. And there's a ton of information on there. There's videos, there's testimonials um, that explain, you know, what it is that we do and what we're about and, and uh, get you the information that you need to, um, to learn more about us. Dr. Warren, yeah. what is your number one health tip? So whether that is mindset, diet and nutrition, physical, emotional, just the one piece of advice you would like everyone to know. You're saying in general, not just for Lyme patients? Just in general, from your own life experience. Hmm, that's an interesting question. Um, I would say, I think in my experience and, and you know, there's a couple of things that are going through my mind uh, right now, but if I was to choose one thing, I, I think it would be to um, stay focused on being proactive with your health. I think part of the, you know, obviously we all live busy lives and, and we have our stresses and, and it's easy to kind of push things aside and put things off. And my experience has been that the, the best medicine is preventative medicine. But the only way to capture that is to, to stay on top of your health and, and to, um, you know, make sure that you're investigating when things aren't working well and, and, you know, trying to do the best that you can to prevent things from going awry. So I think that would be the, the number one piece of advice I would give people. Very well said. Couldn't agree more. Thank you so much for your time, Dr. Warren. This has been really great, and I'm sure it will be very valuable for those listening, and I appreciate you. Yeah, thanks so much. I appreciate you having me.